Uh, so um, I have been given the task to represent the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, which includes lots of different sites and, and different uh, missions, and I'll review that. I'm not going to talk about the RDCRN, which Chris Austin alluded to, but I'm happy to um, over lunch if anyone's interested. So um, just a quick disclosure, our department gets uh, support from Baylor Genetics Laboratory, a joint venture with Morocco Holdings. This is really, I think, um, the major question that we as um, certainly clinicians and researchers are um, focused on and increasingly. How do we functionalize the genome in the face of uh, increasing discovery of rare and or potentially unique variants in individual cases or families with a clinical diagnosis? Um, and I, I think the, one of the contexts of trying to solve this problem has been the Undiagnosed Disease, uh, Diseases Network, another program of the Common Fund. Um, that's been uh, run by an NHGRI. This is um, phase one, um, a description of phase one geographically of the program, which went from 2014 to 2018. Um, it's composed of seven clinical sites, um, two national sequencing centers, and uh, met metabolomics core, as well as uh, the model organism screening center. At Baylor, we had the clinical site, the model or organism screening center, and one of the two sequencing centers. And I'll describe some of the experiences and lessons learned from this first phase, and hopefully it will inform how the collaboration with COMP uh, can go forward, especially in the second phase. Um, this is a, probably a little bit outdated slide. It uh, is February of 2018, provided by Anastasia Wise. But basically, there's been over about 2,000 patients who've been applied. So this is a patient-driven program, so it's somewhat uh, perhaps a little different than what we've heard about today through the gateway. Um, the the pr applications are dis distributed to the different clinical sites, and um, they are then either accepted or um, rejected. And from there, they go on to an in-depth both clinical and research-based um, phenotyping, um, which then includes, but not is not based on just uh, sequencing. Um, primarily, an equal distribution of exomes and genomes have been done. Um, mostly focused on sort of a trio-based approach, uh, and then um, sort of a flow from there to either metabolomics core or, in fact, the model organism um, uh, screening center, which uh, in phase one has been focused primarily on flies and on zebrafish. And um, that output has led to approximately 177 diagnoses or more now that have been made in terms of this cohort. Now, the experience was described and is coming out in a paper that's in press, um, but this sort of summarizes it. There are 40 percent of applicants have been accepted for evaluation. Um, Thirty-two percent actually had clinical exome sequencing when they came to us. Um, not surprisingly, a majority of the phenotype were not neurological, 40 percent, with the rest of the organ systems making up the rest, musculoskeletal um, run second in terms of close to 10 percent and then equal distribution to other systems. The overall diagnostic yield is 35 percent, um, uh, almost viewing this as sort of a research reanalysis of um, an, an individual who may have already had a clinical uh, odyssey type of evaluation. Um, a decent number, 10, uh, 11 percent were based primarily on clinical review, um, 74 percent was based on sequencing, um, about a fifth led to a change in therapy, uh, widely defined. Um, and 37 percent led to actual changes in diagnostic testing, and there have been 31 new syndromes defined. <clears throat> the flow of work, as, um, as I alluded to in the first phase, uh, is sort of patients to the gateway run by the coordinating center, and then to the clinical sites, and then ultimately to sequencing metabolomics and uh, the model organism screening center. Importantly for this group, um, this run by uh, Hugo Bellin at Baylor in collaboration with the zebrafish team at the um, University of Oregon, uh, heavily depends on informatics approach. They've developed this Marvel platform, which tries to aggregate both human and model organism data, which then um, leads to a prioritization and assignment together with the clinical site. So this is important because this is a very integrated and bidirectional uh, interaction, which I think is important in any sort of model going forward for collaboration, will then flow either to the fly or the fish core. Um, during the process, there were 50 genes prioritized for functional studies, 40 in flies, 13 in fish, um, three in both, um, and they have certainly contributed and provided diagnoses in um, at least 12 cases and ruled out candidate genes in eight. 
um, and they were inconclusive uh, in six. Now, as part of this process, um, Baylor, the Baylor site, I think par partly because of uh, the Baylor involvement in the IMPC and the comp program, um, had a small supplement to start to investigate direct interactions almost two years ago, and that's now evolved, obviously, into a more broader engagement uh, of the mosque uh, with um, Comp2 um, specifically. And I think there's a lot of reasons why this, this makes complete sense. Um, there are oftentimes, um, there are genes that have no mouse knockout information that are available that are being prioritized uh, for comp. So, so this is one, certainly, reason. I think there are also UDN variants um, uh, that have been found in Drosophila but have value for further study in mice. But probably most importantly, um, a significant number of genes are obviously duplicated in fish that are difficult to study um, in either fish or flies. And so certainly I think there are increasingly a significant number of genes where we look at specific variants <coughs> and neither fly or fish are the optimal uh, model. And those have been uh, really prioritized in terms of collaboration with COMP. Currently, the status of the um, col uh, collaboration, um, there are 28 genes being studied, of which there have been multiple alleles, um, not just loss of function. Um, there have been 21 null alleles already achieved. I understand there are additional five in production, and um, uh, eight have uh, their phenotype completed. I would also add that, you know, as, as part of this, the, if the effect of the collaboration is amplified because there's obviously expertise, and I'll give you an example of this in my own area of research, where we can then leverage comp to further perform deep phenotyping that really um, sort of closes the circle, um, sort of building on the, on the foundation of comp. And I'll show an example of that from a skeletal perspective where we, as a, as a group, I've been very focused upon it at Baylor. Um, when we sort of put sort of the model organism component in the comp context of what I view as really an, a multi-omic approach to clinical diagnostics, sort of espoused and modeled by the UDN, whole exome and whole genome sequencing um, is certainly um, powering a genotype first or concurrent approach. And there's up to 35% discovery that I think many groups have seen. Uh, on reanalysis, uh, of which about 7% are blended. So this is also interesting. How do you prove an oligogenic um, inheritance or, or causality in humans? And, and obviously model organisms may be one important approach to do that. Uh, functionalizing the genome, while um, metabolomics has been investigated primarily as a research tool, um, Baylor Genetics uh, has implemented this, and I'll show you some of the data from a clinical perspective and what the yield is. I think we've been very focused at Baylor and now also several UDN sites of integrating transcriptomics, and I think that actually further underscores the importance of model organism because we're learning a lot of things in terms of the context of clinical diagnosis that um, I think probably are not unexpected, but underscore the complexity in terms of clinical um, utility. Um, this, of course, is key, and I think COMP agrees with this, and IMPC agrees with this. Clinical phenotyping, whether of a human and a mouse, is absolutely cr critical because of issues of variable expressivity and incomplete penetrance. I think that even without a specific molecular diagnosis, there is potential medical actionability, and I think we've seen examples of that. Um, and this then, you know, again, leads to the practice of medicine, which is management, sometimes without an identifiable cause. And so there is a role for gathering information and knowledge, even without a diagnosis, in informing management. And of course, model organism study is critical because increasingly, the, as you, I, I, as hopefully I'll, I'll convince you, and maybe I don't need to, the interpretation of variants of uh, uncertain significance uh, is, is key from both known and unknown disease genes, especially because of the context of phenotypic expansion. <clears throat> now, I would underscore this. This is somewhat outdated, and this is now being revamped, but the 2015 ACMG guidelines of actual clinical variant interpretation, and I think, you know, Alex's work with ClinGen are informing perhaps the next phase of this. This is um, the category of strong, and within strong evidence includes um, and you can't read this, but basically in vitro and in vivo functional data. And I would put forth that ultimately um, with good in vivo functional data, this sort of uh, should be moved further into the very strong category. And I think this is clear, this is important because from the perspective of interpretation and clinical practice, um, certainly diagnostic laboratories follow the ACMG guideline. But I, I see this sort of as a move, especially as we run into more of these 
um, rare and unique variants. Um, the metabolome is clearly an, a very important component of it. I know this is a, a big part of the phenotyping here in the IMPC, but we have a lot of human clinical um, experience with this. I would just summarize that um, there's no question that from an inborn errors of metabolism perspective, metabolomics, I think, has the potential to really be the best first screening test. It's not very useful in necessarily managing patients, but um, as you can see from data like this generated at Baylor Genetics and Sarah Alcia, um, when you look at the distribution of metabolites in the me metabolomic assay via Z-scores, it will pick up as an initial screen, many of the classical inborn errors of metabolism, but even more importantly, I think can replace two other tests as an initial screening tool, both acylcarnitine profiles um, as well as potentially urine organic acid. So I think the data on that are coming out that perhaps as a first level clinical tool, it may be very useful um, in replacing potentially three different classic biochemical tests. Over 1,000 clinical samples, actually 1,300, have been performed in the last three years at Baylor Genetics. And if we think about the potential contribution, um, uh, in about 37% uh, of the cases, there was information that was helpful. And it was helpful in the, in the different types of areas. It was helpful in um, ruling out potential variants from diagnosis. It was helpful in terms of changing variant classification. Uh, and it was helpful in confirming molecular diagnoses. And this is, of course, both in the context of classical biochemical genetics disorders as well as biochemical genetic uh, or disorders that are not primarily um, based in classical inborn errors of metabolism. If we were to sort of step back and ask what is the overall rate, defining it as a test that actually identified an IEM as well as a test that corroborated potentially or, or supported a, a, a genomic diagnosis of an IEM, we saw that it was as high as 7 percent, so independently um, very useful from a clinical perspective. Now, I think we're, I've certainly been very excited about, and I think increasingly the UDN is, um, has been in moving transcriptomics into the clinical arena. This is an analysis um, that Mahim Jain, uh, now faculty at Hopkins, but previously a, a fellow in my lab, did on, a, on our UDN data set. And really the take home message is that um, when you systematically do whole blood and fibroblast based RNA sequencing in patients, that a significant number of genes, in fact, are expressed um, based on different thresholds of uh, FPKM, whether it's um, OMIM genes um, as, a, as a total, 64 and 40 percent respectively, expressed greater than 1 in 10. Uh, not surprisingly, mitochondrial genes very highly expressed, primary immunodeficient genes, and skeletal dysplasia genes. Less so, not surprisingly, would be genes related to, um, let's say, non-syndromic hearing loss. But clearly, um, powerful insight into a significant percentage of genes that contribute to human disease. And so in the first phase, um, we at Baylor sort of systematically did TRIO RNA sequencing as part of our protocol, um, as well as other sites began also doing this. These are aggregate, aggregate data of cases that we now are putting together as an experience from phase one, from Baylor, Columbia, Stanford, and UCLA. Um, the Columbia site is actually Columbia and Duke. Um, and you can see the distribution of cases. Importantly, the distribution of variants. So this has been an approach of primarily looking at um, RNA-seq as first a tool to help inform interpretation of whole exome and whole genome sequencing. And in this cohort, there were approximately 165 variants which were analyzed. Now, um, what types were variant? What types of variants were, were, were in fact put forth for analysis? Not surprisingly, a significant number, 50, over 50 percent, were deep intronic variants as defined um, by greater than 10 base pairs into the intron. Uh, similarly, um, other sort of variants, including classical splice junction variants as well as intronic variants, 3 to 10 base pairs were high. So clearly these types of variants, whether coming out of exome or genome analysis, are the ones which RNA-seq could potentially inform on, but as well as many of the other types of variants that you can imagine, frame shifts uh, that uh, led to indels and in-frame indels, missense variants, and, and so forth. Now, this is hard to read, I think, from given the projection, but the take-home message is, in fact, when you look at the RNA-seq data and the consequence or the association, I should say, between a specific variant um, 
identified in exome or genome with a, 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 an ob observed effect on transcript is quite diverse. Um, if you look at the first clustering of classical um, splice variants, intronic variants, deep intronic variants, not surprisingly a big majority shown here in gray did, had no effect. But a significant number, in fact, could lead to all sorts of consequences, whether it may be exon skipping or it could be intron retention. Um, and so certainly um, even deep intronic variants, as you would expect, could have an effect in terms of uh, consequence. What's also very interesting is when you look at nonsense and uh, frame shift indels, sort of um, variants which you would expect could cause uh, nonsense mediated decay. There are clearly situations where it doesn't lead to nonsense mediated decay. But more importantly, we see a threshold. It's not plus or minus. And in fact, we see quite complex combinations of relative expressions or relative NMD in one allele uh, versus the other, which may harbor in a recessive disease in missense. And so, you know, one, one sort of hypothesis coming out of this is, in fact, expression pattern and the nature of expression from this uh, uh, allele in cis with a variant could also be a major driver of uh, uh, pleiotropy and variability. And even in the context of um, missense variants, uh, there can be a diverse effect that one could not predict, which again underscores the importance of modeling studies in terms of really taking uh, interpretation to the next step. Um, what is sort of the uh, ultimate yield or the clinical impact? Um, and ag again, obviously, this is context dependent upon how you define different um, uh, effects. Uh, this is obviously based on sort of one context, which I won't have time to, to go, go through. But um, sort of if you think, look at in the yellow, um, it's clear that in a significant number of cases, um, RNA-seq contributed to the actual um, categorization of a variant to being solved, uh, whether it was a prior candidate or in some cases it wasn't even a candidate at all prior to RNA sequencing. Uh, so th that's a value. I think that in terms of um, other value, it can change a strong candidate to a weak candidate in terms of deprioritization. Uh, it can continue to support what was already a strong candidate, or it can even help to rule out, um, and this is especially the case when you have a recessive disease and you have one potential deleterious allele, but we have absence of a second genomic finding. And the finding of sort of normal expression from that allele has been very helpful. And so we've sort of taken the approach that in total, about 21% of the cases were um, helped in terms of a solution with RNA-seq. Um, and actually, um, I would say 12% were cases solved where it was something that um, was sort of not readily apparent just from the genomic interpretation, like an intronic or a synonymous um, uh, SNV or perhaps an in-frame in -frame indel. So again, uh, really, depending upon how strong the nature of a variant is, RNA-C can have increasing impact. So what are the opportunities and challenges for clinical implementation? I think that RNA sequencing is clearly effective for prioritization of variants coming out of WES and, and, and WGS from the context of allele-specific expression, nonsense-mediated decay, and splicing isoforms, something that I think as a field we've often um, ignored clinically. You know, there are uh, four to five isoforms, different isoforms in diff for each gene, and in terms of our clinical interpretation, we've basically been had to ignore that. Um, it can sometimes identify new pathogenic alleles, especially in the context of a recessive disease where you have sort of a beacon in one allele already. Um, we systematically looked at the current in informatics algorithms. We ha I don't have time to show you that data. Um, they're helpful, but as you would expect, just like the informatics algorithms for interpreting um, DNA variants, they're not definitive by any means. Uh, there's no question tissue-specific expression may limit uh, the imp implications or the application for a subset of candidate genes analyzed. Uh, there's no way, good way around that other than probing that tissue. Um, Pathway analysis is, go is actually difficult, while the other deliverable may be to start to correlate pathway signatures that we see, for example, in human tissues versus in model organism tissues, I think an enormous potential. Um, it is difficult because we're not doing classic case cohort type of design. It's a singleton, a patient, versus perhaps a group of individuals. And so that's going to require different informatics approaches. Um, one problem, which is clearly uh, an issue which I have not seen any group tackle effectively, has been to use RNA-seq as a de novo tool, sort of a priori, to ident identify candidates, much like we do today with 
DNA-based an analysis. And part of this challenge has been really the abundance of novel low-frequency splice junctions that we see in RNA sequencing approaches. So there's just so many of these. Um, it's difficult to sort of a priori say, well, what, what's interesting and what's new, what could be, you know, uh, uh, pathogenic. Perhaps trio analysis can help. Um, we, we are systematically trying to look at that, uh, but we don't have an answer yet. And of course, the real world sort of logistics of payer challenges of how to pay for this. I will end, because I know I'm standing between you and lunch and we're behind, with sort of um, two examples um, that um, we've uh, sort of seen where I think our, our lends itself to really rapid translation um, in the context of modeling. One is when you find a deep intronic variant, and uh, even where RNA-seq has been very helpful, but you have basically an N equals one situation. So where even the RNA sequencing may be helpful doesn't really prove it. This was a family that had a Noonan syndrome-like phenotype, and where we identified just by straight whole exome sequencing, uh, heterozygous stop uh, mutation in, in LZTR1, which has been implicated in that pathway. Um, but what was interesting is that when we looked at the RNA sequencing, and here you have control blood, control fibroblasts, and there were two SIBs, um, one, in, one SIBs just for demonstration fibroblasts and the other is uh, blood, uh, was an abnormal splice pattern in this, in this gene, as well as there were alterations in ex allele-specific expression, which pointed to what we then found doing whole genome sequencing was a deep intronic variant at minus 256 position of this intron of this gene, which ultimately, we think, led to a whole host of different um, um, splice patterns. And uh, in fact, um, we did see that in um, sort of an in vitro experiment where we knocked in that variant, so we had isogenic controls and reproduced different splice isoforms. Um, still, uh, this was a question, is this really um, consequential in the context of a first recessive form of Noonan syndrome. Now, at the end of the day, um, much like in the CMG, when there has been, you know, other families that have been identified that supported this, we were able to make the supposition. But you can imagine the challenges in this situation where, in fact, um, you have an intronic variance where there is some data that supports its pathogenicity for actually a recessive form of inheritance uh, where a model organism like uh, specifically in mice because it is an intronic change could be very powerful. And it turns out that this region is highly conserved across human and mice. I think a second situation where, again, at Baylor working with COMP um, actually delivered on a, a, a sort of a pathogenicity conclusion is a variant in this protein COPB2, which we found in a patient with early onset osteoporosis. Um, this is part of a complex um, ER Golgi transport, primarily ER to Golgi, um, which has been um, implicated in many skeletal diseases. Uh, and uh, the RNA-seq data supported, in fact, that there was nonsense-mediated decay um, for uh, this allele, but does, in fact, haploinsufficiency cause an isolated skeletal phenotype in what is a ubiquitously expressed gene. And in fact, rapidly working with COMP, we're able to generate the loss of function as shown here on Western analysis and what is um, a low bone mass phenotype in heterozygote males and females supporting, in fact, um, the, the pathogenicity of this. And in fact, functionally, and so this is where, again, the next step, leveraging local resources is very useful. We were able to do biomechanical studies that actually showed the bone were weaker. I mean, again, supporting that this is a um, heterozygous change that's leading to an early onset osteoporosis um, in, in this patient and potentially in the more general population. So I think there are opportunities for comp modeling of human VUS in the context of clinical discovery and diagnosis. Um, there can be multiple in inputs. And I think at Baylor, um, between the diagnostic lab, the various research consortia, CMG, UDN, um, there's been an a, a, a increasing flow for this. I think another opportunity is industry, which has not been discussed here. I was just at the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research where there have been multiple new therapeutics that have hit uh, in rare disease context. And, you know, as you can imagine, many of the industry are focused on identifying as many patients as possible. Uh, and I put forth a proposal to them. You know, they have been sequencing everybody with certain types of phenotypes, and they discover a lot of VUSs. One approach may be to comprehensively model the, the VUSs, especially on known disease genes which have therapeutic options. You can imagine you're taking really a, a, a different approach. It's discovery that's based on uh, a situation where we have a treatment. 
And so that actually increases the potential value of, you know, this type of uh, program, at least from the th therapeutic perspective, um, given, again, Chris's um, uh, points early in the morning. Uh, clearly, rare missense variants in the context of phenotypic expansion or milder phenotypes, uh, whether they be hypomorphic or neomorphic alleles, are extremely, I think, um, powerful from a modeling perspective, uh, difficult for us to interpret in the clinical perspective. Um, but even apparent loss of function variants, and, and some of the RNA-seq data are clearly showing that variants that you would think would be apparent loss of functions can, in fact, have uh, different cons consequences on, on splicing. And expression, and so there may be value in modeling that in vivo uh, in a mouse, especially if uh, there is conservation of those genes. Um, there is no question, as you can see, how we sort of drove as a, as a group um, RNA sequencing um, interpretation. It's driven primarily by non code invariants, given their defects, uh, diverse effects on transcript and isoform expression. So that's certainly an enormous opportunity. And ultimately, it's to improve interpretation in the clinical context. And I'm hopeful that in the new iteration of the guidelines, in vivo functional data will actually be even elevated. Um, and importantly, um, you know, you, we all see the OMIM. Um, graph with the number of genes going up rapidly. But, you know, in fact, the correlation of known genes with phenotypes in the context of phenotypic expansion is an enormously exciting opportunity for, you know, studying unique structure function correlations. And so I don't think we should forget about the basic science opportunity um, f from that sort of um, portion of the OMIM graph. So with that, um, I will leave you with this is phase two of UDN, which has expanded now to 12 sites. Uh, there is now one national sequencing core at Baylor, and the Model Organism Screening Center has actually expanded to include um, worms. And um, hopefully there will be even a more robust, robust flow into IMPC and COMP. And sort of this is the, um, the schematic as it now stands for phase two. And I want to acknowledge really all the folks involved in the UDN. Thank you. Brendan, I have special requests. Yeah, th there's no question that RNA-seq is valuable. In, in the data you showed, I think you combined leukocyte plus fibroblast RNA. Correct. And could Correct. you speak to how valuable straight white cell leukocyte RNA-seq is? Yeah, so is? I have some data on, on that, which I can't show. So uh, I can't show because I don't have it. I would yeah. show you otherwise. So um, not surprisingly, if you look at clustering, Fibroblast RNA-seq clusters much better, even across unrelated individuals, if you do sort of the clustering analysis. And, uh, uh, and white cells are much more distributed, as we would expect, because it's a, you know, a primary uh, heterogeneous mix of, of, of tissue. Having said that, I think for certain diseases, it's actually quite informative, especially for the primary amino deficiencies. Um, and so... Right, so if you could, you want to go back to this slide, um, just go back quickly. So if you look at autism genes, about 62% express greater than 1, between 1 and 10, um, and about 32% um, greater than 10. So obviously less useful, but again, um, you know, if you think about our diagnostic rate of 35%, that's not bad. It's all context. So, so I think there clearly is still a use even for, you know, autism or neurodegeneration type genes. But it's not just how many, I mean, it's also the way dynamic range is, right? Because Absolutely. Two proteins Absolutely. might be expressed, but one of them might have a slightly intense exposure that the single that, gene That's exactly correct. This is, this is why I think that, you know, we, we present it as thresholds yeah. to give you the dynamic range. So between 60 and 30, depending upon how lucky you are. Good topic to okay. discuss at lunch. <laughs> so we have an hour for lunch. If you can get back, we'll pretend it's quarter of and not ten of. Get back by quarter of. We'll do everything we can to stay on track. Thank you. <laughs>